All right, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, today our, uh, our speaker, Kelvin Walker. And Kelvin has been a friend of New Life for years, uh, Rich and myself. He actually led worship here for a number of years uh, when our Sunday evening services. Actually, Kelvin uh, has been a pastor out in Pittsburgh. He was campus pastor at Nia College. Now he's pastoring a church called Bedford Community Church up in Westchester County. And so I'd like to ask you to give him a nice, warm, new life welcome as we welcome Kelvin to us here today. Good afternoon. It has been great to be here all day with you. It, felt, it feels like coming home. Uh, I think remember the years of being here as part of New Life uh, Fellowship, and uh, it's just been good for my soul to be here, to not only be a part of the service, but also to receive as I have been here, and so we're grateful for this opportunity. Uh, would you join me in prayer as we begin our time? Father, all morning long, you have had specific things that you have said to specific people uh, as a result of your word, and so today... As we are in this service, may it be no different. Lord, pour out your word for this group in this service, for this time, at the season that we're in in our lives. Uh, Lord, we thank you for that you have been present with us, continue to be present with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So my wife and I have six kids. They range in age from 24 down to 15. Uh, three boys and three girls. Right now, we have one at home, and she reminds us every day that she is the only one and needs the special attention that she didn't get when her brothers and sisters were home. So we have, again, six kids. Uh, I'm, when we were living in Pittsburgh, there was a time where we were a friend a family, of the family that we were very close to. They came over one night, and my youngest son, Philip, who's now uh, going to be 22, he was about seven or eight at the time. Um, we were sitting in the kitchen with this couple, and all of the kids are sitting out in the living room and hanging out. And my son, Philip, uh, begins to act out in ways that I would consider unseemly for a, child, a walker child to act. So from the kitchen, I said, hey, cut that out. And we continued to talk. Here's what we were talking about. We were commiserating commiserating over the, uh, uh, the issues that we were having with our kids. They were sharing something they had gone through that day with, with one of their kids, and we were sharing something that we had gone through one of the day with, that day with one of our kids. And it seemed like the stories kept going back and forth. And every time they'd share something, you'd think, oh, well, you think that's bad. Let me share this with you. So we're going back and forth. And Philip begins to act up. And I said, cut it out. We continued to talk. He continued to act up. And I said, cut it out. That was like the second time, so he knew that the third warning was coming. And finally, as we're going along, I just said, Philip, stop it. And as I said that, the Lord said to me, why don't you go get him and take him upstairs and ask him what's wrong, ask him what the matter is. So I took him upstairs to our room and I sat down on my bed and sat him on my lap. And I said, buddy, what's wrong? This is not like you. What's going on? He asked me this question, Dad, do you enjoy children? Do I enjoy children? Do I enjoy? We have six kids. Do I enjoy? Philip, you know I love you. And then he said this, I know you love me, Dad, but do you enjoy me? Yeah, that's pretty much the, the answer that was coming from me. It was, wow, do I enjoy? See, he had been listening to the conversation that was going on in the kitchen. And for us as parents, the conversation was simply, let me show you what, you, what I'm going through, let me share with you what I'm going through. And it was sort of this kind of thing like, okay, we're, we're going through this together. For Philip, as he's listening to the conversation, he does not hear that I enjoy being his father. That was big. As I thought about that later, and I thought about that question, what Philip was really asking me was this. Do you love me with prodigal love? Now, that may seem like a strange word because when we think of that word prodigal, we normally put that in terms of someone who is wayward, someone who is lost. But I want to share with you the, the definition of prodigal. Prodigal means extravagant and lavish, 
and exuberant and opulent and abundant and generous, open-handed and liberal. And sometimes we get tripped up because prodigal also means wasteful. And we think that is something that is, is bad. But in, in, in connection with what we're saying here, prodigal really is quite different than as we see it. Philip was asking me, do you love me extravagantly and opulently and lavishly and exuberant? Do you love me with uh, generosity and open-handedly and, 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 and liberally? Dad, do you love me with prodigal love? We are all, at some point in our, our lives, we, we've all gotten used to the idea of being loved with a controlled love or a conditional love or a love that comes with all of these demands. We have all encountered people in our lives, maybe in our family, maybe in our workplaces, maybe in, the, the, in our friendships where people have said, you know, if you do this or you act this way or you say this or you walk this way or you look this way, then I will love you. That's conditional love. Prodigal love, the kind of love that Philip was asking me if I loved him with, has no conditions, no demands. Even if I act out, Dad, do you love me? Do you enjoy me? As we flesh out this idea of prodigal love, I invite you on this journey with me through a passage of Scripture that may be familiar to some of you and may not be familiar to, to others of you. It's the passage in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, known as the, the, the story of the prodigal son. It's right at the end of a, a series of parables that Jesus does. Parable of three, where he talks about lost. The lost coin, the lost sheep, and then the lost or the prodigal son. Now, I would suggest to you that we rename this passage the, the, past, the parable of the prodigal father, or in the terms that I've uh, titled this sermon today, the, 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 the parable of the step-cutting and daddy. And we're going to find out about that a little later. And, the reason why, later. and the reason why I would suggest that is because, really, as you look at this story, it's the father, based on our definition, who is the one who is the prodigal. It's the father who gives prodigal love. He displays prodigal love. He loved extravagantly and opulently and abundantly and generously and open-handedly and liberally. And so I invite you, if you will, read with me, uh, beginning uh, in Luke chapter 15. We're going to begin with verse 11 and read this story so that we get the context. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided, it, divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the, in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. 
So the father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. But you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Prodigal love. The father is the one who's the prodigal in this story. And so as I look at this, a question continually comes to mind. That question is this. What exactly does prodigal love look like? How does it look to love in a way that says, I enjoy you? What does it look like to say to someone, I love you beyond just words. I enjoy you no matter what. Here's what I discovered. Prodigal love is a love that first is restorative and redemptive, even in the face of rebellion. Prodigal love, redemptive and restorative, even in the face of rebellion. Picture this. The father's son leaves and then decides he's going to come back. And while he's a ways off, he hasn't even gotten to the house Possibly so far off, it would be hard for anyone else to recognize that it's this boy. While he's so far off, the father sees him, and he's moved down in his gut. That word compassion is not just he had feelings toward him. He was moved in his gut. It was as if there was this fire of love in his stomach, and he runs out, and he meets this boy. And when he gets there, he says, bring the best robe. Quite possibly, he was wearing the best robe. Put it on him. Put the ring on his finger. It would have been a signet ring, the family ring. It would have borne the family emblem as a reminder to this son, you got rid of your birthright. I never lost sight of who you are. You gave up your identity. Because in fact, what the boy was saying to the father was, listen, I'm done with this family. It's over. I don't even want to know that you're alive anymore. You're as good as dead to me. Give me my share of the estate. I know what my dad would have said. Your share of the estate? How much of that estate did you earn? Oh, so you want me to give up the money that I earned so that you could have a good life. Well, let me tell you something. Why don't you go out there and have a good life? Let me know how how that's working for you. Then come back. Give me my share of the estate. That didn't happen until the father died. But this boy wanted it now. Basically, he was saying to the dad, you are as good as dead. The father didn't even wait for him to get the words out of his mouth. He runs to him. He says, put a ring on his finger. Remind him of his identity. Prodigal love is redemptive and restorative, even in the face of rebellion. Uh, I'm thinking of a, a passage of, of A.B. Simpson, who, is the, uh, who was the uh, uh, founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, often, talks about, uh, often talked about the, the love of, of God, and he called it the, the agape love, uh, and he said it this way. Agape love or a father, the love of the father is love that learns to love the unlovely into loveliness. Agape love. Love that learns to love the unlovely into loveliness. Maybe we can paraphrase that a bit and say prodigal love is love that learns to love the unlovely into loveliness. It is redemptive and restorative even in the face of rebellion. And secondly, it is extravagant even though it risks embarrassment. Extravagant, even though it risks embarrassment. If you look at this passage, you'll see that the father runs out to the son as the son is coming home. Now, the picture would be this. The father would have to lift his robe to run. And he might even have been barefoot. 
as he's running after this son. That would have been a disgrace. The father running after a rebellious son. In fact, in that society, it was pretty bold of the son to come home. That's not something that would have happened. Here's why the father would have been running. To embrace the son, to kiss him and to wrap his arms around him, to show him his love, but also to embrace the son and to wrap his arms around him to cover him. Because the elders may have been waiting at the gate. In Deuteronomy, when a kid is that rebellious, the parents ought to take the kid to the elders, and the elders would stone the kid. So can you imagine this father seeing his son off in a distance, seeing the elders at the gate, and trying to figure out how he's going to get to his boy before the elders did? And he wraps his arms around him, and he covers him. And the elders are ready to stone this kid, and then they're looking at the father thinking the father must be stoned. Something must be up with this man. That he would cover his kid. They're ready to take this kid out. So the father covers him to save his life. But let's look at that, old, that, that, that eldest son who's out in the, the fields not wanting to come in. So upset. So angry. So arrogant. So accusatory that he won't even go in and celebrate that his lost brother is now home. And what does the father do to him? He lifts his robe and he goes out to him. And he begs him to come in. Now with the, with the younger son, it was saving him, saving his life. With the eldest son, he wanted to save him from himself. Anger, bitterness, resentment. Arrogance, all inward, just seething, it's going to destroy him. The father wants to save him. In both cases, the father acts in a way that people would have looked at him and said, that is embarrassing. That's prodigal love. Redemptive and restorative, even in the face of rebellion. Extravagant, even though it risks embarrassment. And finally, it is unconditional even when it is unrequited or unreturned. Look at the father. He's going after both boys. Some of the hardest verses appear in this passage, verses 14 to 20. We start to realize that the father loves the son, but what is it that brings this youngest boy back? Hunger. He didn't come back because he had this revelation of how much the father loved him. He didn't come back because he had this revelation about how much he loved the father. The boy came back because he was hungry. His stomach was growling, and he wanted to silence the sound of that empty stomach. Not even pig food was given to him. That says something right there. In his culture, to be willing to work with pigs, he's that hungry. That's what drove him back, not love for the father. But look at the oldest son. Here is the father equally showing extravagant love to his boys. What kept him loyal to the father? Servitude. He didn't see himself as the father's son. He saw himself as the father's servant who had the right to anything that the father had. Why? Because he was loyal and dedicated And he stood by the dad. And here the dad wouldn't even give him a cow. I want a goat. That's all I want. You give this brother a cow. It was hatred that kept the elder son from coming home. Now, I want to show you how this plays out. Uh, Someone who has has um, the Bible open, can you turn to this passage and look at verse 33? Luke 15, verse 33. Can anybody find it? There is no verse 33. I'm not trying to trick you. I just want to point out to you that there is no indication that this son ever returned from his arrogance, his anger, his accusation. There is no evidence that this boy ever returned from his hatred and his bitterness 
and his resentment. But what we do see is that the father continually pours out his love, pours out his love, continues to go after his boys. Even though the love is not returned, he still seeks after them. Prodigal love. It's love that is redemptive and restorative, even in the face of rebellion. It's love that's extravagant, even though it risks embarrassment. It's love that's unconditional, even when it is unrequited or unreturned. This is the kind of love that the father had for his son. This is the kind of love that the father has for us. This is the kind of love that the father wants us to share with each other. And embracing the prodigal heart of the father, the love of the father, only happens when we come to a place of loving in a redemptive, extravagant, and unconditional manner. This is a picture of God's love for us. And so as I look at this, and you, you're wondering, okay, so what else is there? I, I know you've got this question. We get this now, so why the title? What about the step cutting daddy? I know the whole time I've been preaching, you've been thinking about this, this, this question. What, why did you title this? What about the step cutting daddy? You've been thinking about it? I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about it. I grew up in what's called a Baptocostal church. We were Baptists that worshiped like Pentecostals. And any given Sunday, somebody would be blessed, somebody would get hit with the Spirit, and they would start to dance. And when they started to dance, we would say so-and-so was cutting their step. So so-and-so, sister so-and-so over here would get hit with the Spirit, and she would start cutting her step. Or maybe brother so-and-so over here would get hit with the Spirit, and then we watched them and said, oh, brother so-and-so cut his step today. There was always that one person that no matter what was going on, every time, every Sunday, at the same spot in the service, it would happen. You would start to count. Three, two, one. Yes, and it starts down. Cutting this step. I want to show you something here. Look at this verse from Zephaniah 317. It says this, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight over you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That word rejoice means to whirl about with exceedingly great joy. Friends, we have a step-cutting daddy in God. When he sees us, he lifts his robe and he cuts his step. When he sees us, he rejoices over us with singing. When he sees us, he gets so filled with joy that he can't help himself. That's my child. That's my son. That's my daughter. And it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. My love for you is extravagant. My love for you is redemptive. My love for you is restorative. My love for you is unconditional. And every time I see you, I cut my step. I invite you to close your eyes for a minute and just get this picture in your mind. Can you see him? He's decked out in one of the most extravagant robes you've ever seen. And he's coming toward you. And as he does, he lifts his robe. And there is a skip in his step like you've never seen before. And as he gets to you, he puts his hand on the ring the signet ring that reminds you that you are his, that your identity is found in him. And can you hear it? Can you hear the beautiful song? It may sound like this. I sing a song of joy over you, my people. I whirl about and dance. I'm dancing as I sing, for I've created you in my image. And I place my precious seal on your heart. And I clap my hands 
as I whirl about with joy. Yes, I clap my hands as I whirl about with joy. Redemptive love, unconditional love, extravagant love. This is the prodigal love And as you open your eyes, you might be thinking, wow, I have never, ever known that that kind of love is for me. I have never, ever realized that I could receive that kind of love. A love that someone is dancing over. And if that's you this morning, the Father is saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. My love for you is the same as it was yesterday, and it will be for tomorrow. It's the love that I received when I was 17. I'm 49 years old, and I've been basking in that love ever since. Maybe as you open your eyes, you realize, wow, that's a love that either I maybe refused is a, 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 a strong word. Maybe it's more I can't seem to break through to receive. Because the only love I have known is the imperfect love of those who have hurt me, those who have abused me, those who have mocked me those who have given that love out to me in such messed up ways that it is hard for me to picture that the Father has this kind of love for me. And to you, the Father says, I want to break through with this kind of love. Because in this kind of love, I can bring healing, not only to your broken but I can redeem and restore that which has been stolen, that which has been taken. Or maybe you're like me as you open your eyes and you celebrate the fact that you receive this kind of love, that you walk in this kind of love, and you bask in this kind of love, but you do not give this kind of love. The kind of love that you give is conditional. I'll love this group. Ain't no way I'm loving that group. I enjoy this group, but I tolerate this group. If you're like me, the transitions in life have brought challenges that are different. A transition through where my kids are right now because they're all at different ages and different stages. I transition in my church because we are going into a new season of what God is doing and what God is bringing. I transition as I teach year after year at the college and the seminary and different groups of students come in and I encounter them. And within each group that I've just mentioned, sometimes I have to take a step back and be reminded that godly love, prodigal love, agape love is learning to love the unlovely then I have to be reminded that for them, I might be the unlovely one. And for you, and for me, the Father says, my love for you has not changed. My son is the same yesterday, today, and forever. My spirit is poured out on you freely. And so I'm opening your eyes to those that you have loved conditionally so that I can help you transform how you love. Wherever you are, know that the prodigal love of the Father is for you. And know that the, Father, the prodigal love of the Father is being poured out on you. He is dancing over you. And he is transforming you so that you can dance over others. As the worship team comes, 
and we uh, prepare to go to the table. My prayer for you is that you will receive this love and that you would extend this love. Let me invite the prayer teams to come forward here as we close. And I want to invite, we're going to, before I'm going to speak a blessing over you, before I do, I just want to give an invitation. If you are, you know, you're, you're struggling, if you're struggling to receive the love of God that it might enter into you, and uh, one of the ways you know that is, uh, one of the ways I know it myself is when a person's driving me crazy and there's not a lot of love coming out of me towards them. And you know what it is? You, you can't forgive people. It's God's got to give you the grace to forgive them. You know, you open yourself up and say, God, I need you to give me the love that I can actually love this person. It's a really, it's a miracle of grace. But, you know, the elder brother in that parable, the prodigal son, he just, it was all in his head about the love of God, but it wasn't entering his heart. And uh, that's the great challenge, isn't it? To, to become the recipient of the love of God in our hearts and not simply in our heads. So as we close, if you're, you're, you know that wall is just, you're having a tough time, it's not getting into you. Please come forward for prayer. Let us pray for you. Let God touch you. God does miracles in those places of prayer that can happen no other way. Listen, the whole Christian life is all grace. It's all a miracle. And our role is to be receiving his love on a consistent basis. And maybe right now, before we leave here, you need to do that for yourself. So please come. All right, so I'm going to invite you to open up your hands up towards heaven like this to receive a blessing as we close. And So may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may our God make his face shine on you, and may the Lord pour out his love, may it just wash over you like a waterfall now, and, and may his love just penetrate into your heart of heart, into the depths of your innermost being, and may the Lord free you of every shackle and chain that you may have picked up along the way of life. And may you know this love that surpasses knowledge. And may it give you courage and freedom to live the life that God has set out for you. And may you not be afraid as you look forward to what lies ahead. And may you have the courage to follow the dreams and visions God will give you for your life, even for this week. May you be freed by his love. And may you be a, a vessel that spreads that love wherever you go. And may Jesus be ever real to you in a personal way in a deep way this week. And uh, may your life be the gift for the world that God intends. So be blessed, I pray, as you leave this place. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. Thank you, everybody. Lord bless you. Have a great day. And thank you, worship team.